Hi, Dr. Jenny. Welcome to the Genetic Genius Podcast. I'm so excited to have you as a guest today. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you from the other side of the pond. <laughs> That's right. Yes. Even, and I love that about the uh, internet or the, the Zoom. You can't really tell where everybody is, but yes, you are in the UK. So welcome from across the pond. <laughs> I you. love London. It's beautiful. Today, yeah, the sun has been shining today. Oh, good. <laughs> That's great. Today, we're going to be talking all about your new book, which I'm so excited. It's a wonderful book and it's specifically focused on the toxins in our body, the planetary toxins, how we can eat for the seasons. You're going to dive deep into telling everybody about that. But before we like totally jump into that, I'd love for you to just tell a little bit about yourself, a little bit about your background so that the listeners can get to know you a little bit better. Okay, sure. Thank you. I went to medical school a very long time ago, 1976 to 1982. And I entered medical school as a very idealistic young woman and, and I, there were three things I wanted to do. I wanted to heal the sick, although I'd been warned not to say that in an interview for medical <laughs> school, so I didn't. It was already uncool to say that. Mm -hmm. But as well as not wanting to heal the sick, I, I also wanted to learn the causes of illness and how to prevent illness. Mm -hmm. And I still want to know those things. And that's what I work with now. But sadly, they taught me nothing about causation or prevention in six years of medical school and many years of practice after that, and very little about how to heal the sick, actually. And as I was going through medical school as a young person, I didn't have a clear critique of what was wrong, but I did have a clear sense that something was wrong and that everyone who arrived in the hospital wards was already very sick. They already had, had a heart attack or they had cancer or they had rheumatoid arthritis that had been bothering them for years, diabetes or something pretty drastic. And, and all we could do was either surgery or radiation or what I ended up calling the anti-drugs. So all the pharmaceutical interventions, antibiotics, anti-epileptics, anti-inflammatories, antihypertensives, antihistamines, anti. And I did start to wonder why we're always fighting the body's processes. Mm -hmm. Is there some way we could get alongside the body and ask a simple question, what's it missing? What does the body need? What is not in there that should be? And what is in there that shouldn't be? And fast forward quite a very long way. In the 1990s, I discovered there was a group of doctors asking those very same questions um, and finding answers in a way that I hadn't. That's the British Society for Ecological Medicine. And it's pretty similar to what you call functional medicine in the States. It's the same principles, but there are two particular reasons in my understanding why we call it ecological medicine. One is that it sees the whole body as one joined up ecosystem. I call this joined up medicine. So for example, in conventional medicine, in the orthodox world, if you have, let us say, a really bad rash on your skin and a lot of pain in your joints and difficulty breathing, you will be sent to three different specialists, the dermatologist, the rheumatologist, and the chest physician or the respiratory doctor. None of them will ever converse with each other. <laughs> and if you did, put them in a room to have a meeting, they wouldn't know what to say. They're mm -hmm. each stuck in their silos, their own compartments of the body. And of course, from the patient's point of view, this is all happening in their one body. So we are ecological in the sense of asking, what are the underlying factors? And it's usually plural. What are the factors contributing to things going wrong in three parts of this person's body, the skin, the joints, the lungs, and probably if you look closely elsewhere as well, probably the gut they didn't even bother to mention. The other sense in which this is ecological medicine is that we cannot separate the person from the planet. We cannot separate your body from the body of the earth that you live on mm. because whatever's in the soil gets into your food, gets into your body. And that might be good nutrients or they might be missing from years of intensive over farming. And it might be pesticides or herbicides in the soil, in the food, in you. Similarly, with the pollution in our water, which is some of the same chemicals that run off into the reservoirs and what is coming out of your tap. I mean, we can talk about that later, but certainly here, chlorine and increasingly fluoride, as well as residues of heavy metals, insecticides and halogens 
um, and hormones, all those are in your tap water. It's getting into you through drinking, through inhalation of the steam and through showering and, and bathing. And lastly, of course, what's in the air from vehicle exhaust primarily, but also other sources of air pollution, which is not just outdoors, it's in your home. And the pollution in your home is actually an area which I'm quite excited about because there's so much you can do to change it. You can make the air in your home completely non-toxic with a few tips about what chemicals not to use and what to substitute. So for all these reasons, it's ecological medicine and we cannot separate the health crisis from the ecological crisis. So you can't poison the planet without poisoning the person. And mm -hmm. so in the British Society for Ecological Medicine, we look at the pandemics that are raging across the globe. And by the pandemics, I actually mean cancer, heart disease, diabetes, dementia, neurodegenerative diseases, autoimmune diseases. All of these were rare or even unknown before the Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. They are the diseases of toxicity. And we have caused them, we can treat them, and we can prevent them, but not by orthodox. Dr. Jenny, that was so great. I'm so excited for our conversation today. And I loved how you talked about that the explanation of the ecological medicine, because for a lot of our US listeners, it's a term that we're not as familiar with. So that was great that you laid that foundation. And it's very similar to naturopathic medicine that I practice, having that addressing the root cause of the illness and not mm -hmm. just treating the symptoms, which we have, are know <laughs> around the planet, we know that's not working <laughs> because exactly. sup suppressing the body's abil ability to heal is backfiring <laughs> in a huge yes, way. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, so today we're going to dive deep into talking about how um, toxins are affecting the body, how it's correlated to the earth, which you made that connection already. I loved. And then we're also going to be talking about your book, Staying Alive in Toxic Times. And can you show a picture? It's so beautiful. I love it. Yay. There it is. So for listeners, if you're not um, on YouTube, it's such a beautiful book. It's got these beautiful plants and I just love it. So I will talk about how to get it. And I love it has, it has the stethoscope <laughs> around it too. So it has that, the combination of plant medicine and the earth and yeah. the actual like functional aspect of medicine coming together as one. It's so beautiful. And so, but as we're getting started today, Dr. Jenny, I'd like for you to talk about these, these three fun, important issues, which you kind of already touched on in the beginning of your book, you talk about what causes illness how we can prevent illness and how we can heal the sick. And I think those three things are so important for people to understand. And I'd love for you to just talk about those for a few minutes. Okay. In one sense, those three are all the same <laughs> because if you're trying to prevent an illness, you need to know what causes it. And if you're trying to treat an illness, you also need to know what caused it. Let me give you an example where treatment and prevention are the same in quality, but different in degree, okay? If I want to stay healthy and I know I'm living in a polluted world, I will educate myself about where those pollutants are coming from. I can't do much about the traffic going past outside my door, but I can stop using toxic oven cleaners. I can stop spraying nasty antibacterial stuff that we don't need on the kitchen work surfaces. I can replace all that with a damp cloth. But if I want my house to smell beautiful, instead of scented candles or artificial air fresheners and artificial perfumes, which are really nasty petrochemicals, I can get some natural essential oil. Mm -hmm. you know, lavender or geranium or orange flower jasmine there are some beautiful natural scents which you can burn or you can use on yourself so i will do all those things to avoid the toxins but i will also be doing organic vegetable juicing having epsom salts baths taking vitamin c vitamin d certain minerals like magnesium and zinc daily. I'll be watching that I'm having the good oils and not the bad toxic ones in my cooking. And I'll be doing the occasional sauna in a particular way I can describe for you later. Mm -hmm. But if I'm perfectly well and I'm just trying to stay well, I'll be doing all that in moderation. So I'll maybe be doing vegetable juicing once or twice a week, although I'll be eating strictly organic. Mm -hmm. If somebody, God forbid, actually has cancer, if they have established cancer, I will still want them to be vegetable juicing, mm -hmm. but now, poor soul, they're going to be needing to do it every day, two, three, four times a day, mm -hmm. because you are that much further down the path of pathology and you need to do the same stuff, but much more intensively. 
they will need to be much more fanatical about avoiding toxins. They will need to take supplements in far higher dosage than you do for prevention. So essentially, whether you're dealing with prevention or treatment, the principle is to put the good stuff in, that's the nutrients, and we need to talk about why they're missing in the first place, many reasons, mm -hmm. and take the bad stuff out, which is the pollution that we've been accumulating since the industrial revolution and some of it accumulated in our parents and grandparents bodies and we've got it direct through the placenta mm -hmm. as well as what we're exposed to in our own day-to-day -day lives and it's not just your exposure now it's what you were exposed to 10 20 years ago so if you've got what you guys call silver fillings mm -hmm. and we call metal amalgam fillings they have got silver in them but they've got a deal more mercury and tin that is going to be poisoning you to some extent and is a risk of neurological disease but if you haven't but your mum had them in her body when she was pregnant with you then you will have it from that source as well so that's why I take a very detailed occupational history environmental history of your exposures your parents occupation all that sort of thing when you've got that kind of knowledge you can treat and you can prevent. And yes, it is pretty much like naturopathic medicine. Um, but we do a lot of blood testing to find out what toxins are in a person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, oh, great, Dr. Jenny. It's so true. And you know, I really liked how you touched um, basis on that heavy metal exposure because we're seeing, I work with a lot of patients with testing and working with the heavy metals and detoxification. And it's so true mm -hmm. that we're seeing so much more of that in yeah. our, our body, because I think there's multiple factors like you're going to talk about one, yeah. we have a more toxic environment, everything coming in from the generational DNA and through our genetics and through the placenta, like you mentioned, and then all of our foods, how do listeners not be worried? We can't live in a okay. bubble. <laughs> the reason, yeah, the reason that I wrote the book was so that people could on the one hand have the information and on the other hand, have the tools to do something about it because initially it can seem quite daunting and quite frightening. And you think, mm -hmm. oh my God, I'm being poisoned. Right. Ah, right. Right. Everything, everything around me is poisoned. I'm just going to put my head in the sand and <laughs> right. pretend that I don't know. <laughs> Go up, actually, live up in the woods or something like that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but actually it's empowering mm -hmm. to have the knowledge because then you can do something about it for yourself and for your kids, your friends. With the possible exception of traffic fumes, which if you live on a busy road, it's a problem. Mm -hmm. um, although it's only a problem at ground level, it's mostly a risk for toddlers and little kids because mm -hmm. they're walking along with their noses at the same height as the exhaust. But if you're pretty well above it and a few yards away, meters away from it, even that you can do something about, you can wear a mask in fact, but everything right. else, there are simple solutions and that's what the book's about. Mm -hmm. um, but I think where we need to start is our poor nutrition. One of my most brilliant colleagues described toxins as anti-nutrients mm -hmm. they do their damage largely by pushing the good stuff the nutrients out of the body and conversely most of detoxification or unpoisoning as I call it is about putting the good stuff back in mm -hmm. and, and these are intertwined in many ways so we talk about detoxing but actually I say to my patients I can't detoxify you your liver can <laughs> exactly and it's your liver that's doing the detox and guess what your liver needs for its enzymes that break down the toxic chemicals to work? Vitamins and minerals. Yep. <laughs> particular vitamins, particular minerals for particular liver enzymes. Mm -hmm. So because we're living in such a polluted world, our need is greater. But at the same time, our need is increased. And actually, it's increased by emotional stress as well as by pollution. Mm -hmm. Because if you're really stressed, you use up all your B vitamins at an astonishing rate. And they are needed by the liver for all its detox enzymes as well. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, our need for nutrients has increased. Our intake has decreased. Right. So and the scale is not balanced anymore. Yeah, so... You know, if you were living, let's say, in 1700 in a little village in England or the States, you could have got your daily portion of calcium and magnesium from one plate of broccoli. Mm -hmm. And now you can't for several reasons. Partly our food is grown a long way from where we live. It's packaged. It's wrapped in plastic. It may be even irradiated to preserve it. It's mm -hmm. stored. Mm -hmm. By the time we get it, it's not fresh. But even more fundamental than that, the very soil that it's grown in has been depleted of nutrients. So if the magnesium and the zinc, the selenium and the iodine are not in the earth, 
Mm -hmm. because we've had now three or four generations of intensive farming, which means extractive mentality, taking more out of the earth than the earth has to give, failing to remember traditional regenerative farming methods, which plowed back the stubble, gave the land a break, because the land starts, it needs a break and a rest mm -hmm. from time. Let it lie fallow, used tools that didn't damage it rather than heavy mechanical plows that break up the structure and cut up the earthworms, which are vital. Mm -hmm. And not only force the land to produce two or three crops in a season instead of one, draining the nutrients, but then put in artificial fertilizers and then put in what I call biocides, which is mm -hmm. the collective term for pesticides, insecticides, fungicides, and herbicides. These toxins, which are meant to kill certain bugs that eat crops, actually damage all living things. They mm -hmm. were developed from nerve gases. Right. And they are toxic to the nervous system and the reproductive system, and they're carcinogenic. So all that has happened to the soil. That's going to be affecting what you eat. And therefore, we need more nutrients than ever as well as the awareness to eat only organic food. Now, I am sometimes, <laughs> I'm sometimes told, oh, it's all very well for you, Dr. Jenny, to say we must eat organic, but organic produce is much more expensive. But you're, it's your life. <laughs> well, it's your life. But, and there are three answers to that. One is you've got to prioritize it because in the 1950s, the average household spent 33% of its income on food. Right. We spent a third of all our money on food. Now it's down to about 8%. Wow. 8%? So, <laughs> yeah, which is ridiculous. Yeah. So we have to prioritize it. You know, mm -hmm. we have to increase the proportion of our income we're prepared to spend on food and not expect it to be cheap because it's the most precious and important thing we buy. Mm -hmm. And there are things we can go without so we can eat organic. Second is, particularly if you're a carnivore, if you're a meat eater and you change to organic, yeah, one organic chicken is more expensive than one horrible poisoned battery reared chicken. Right. But start eating it once or twice a week instead of five or six times a week. Every day. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's better for you. It's better for the planet. So, you know, mm -hmm. you can eat less meat, but then you can afford for it to be free range, humanely reared and organic. Mm -hmm. So it's not got bad chemicals. It's not got bad karma. Mm -hmm. right? And the third answer to, oh, dear me, organic is so expensive is yeah, this is a collective problem. It's a political problem. And we should be writing to our politicians and say, mm -hmm. certainly in the UK, this is the case. Why are you still subsidizing the big agrochemical farms that cover the land with monocrops, one plant from here to the horizon, mm -hmm. no biodiversity, which is why we end up with no biodiversity in our microbiome. <laughs> exactly. That is the same <laughs> thing. Why aren't you subsidizing the organic farmers? They enable all of us to be healthier. It's collective action that's needed as well. Yeah. Oh, Dr. Jenny, those are great points. And I um, work at a farm. I run the medicinal garden and I um, do that from in the season when the garden is really flourishing. And I am always amazed. And you know, one, it, for me, it's so great to work with patients and show them the actual like plant. And I have people that come and work with me at the farm. And I think we've lost that touch with the actual plants too, because we don't think about how much it takes for that plant to make that food for us too. Mm -hmm. It's not when we take it off the shelf, it's, it's like the same with the animals. We've lost that connection to the, the plant medicine, the plant energy, the plant food. And I think that if we can move into that state of, even if you have a little tiny like garden with your friends and neighbors, something that you're growing for yourself so you can be a part of it, being that love, all of that, and really appreciate it. <laughs> it is absolutely. And there is a spectrum from food to medicine mm -hmm. um, and herbs and herbal remedies are in the middle of that spectrum. Mm -hmm. There's culinary herbs mm -hmm. and there's medicinal herbs. They're the same things. You right, know? exactly. You, say, <laughs> you grow these plants organically, you touch them, you smell them, you see them and and you eat them. And this is the medicine that we as women have been providing for thousands of years. Right. It's not new. <laughs> so it is the oldest form of medicine. And actually, even when I started medical school in the mid 70s, one third of all pharmaceutical drugs were still derived from plants. Mm -hmm. So we had digitalis from the foxglove and we had mm -hmm. you know, aspirin from, from salix, the white willow, salicylic mm -hmm. acid. And one third of them still were. But the crucial difference is that a natural herbal remedy 
is a whole food. It's a whole plant, a whole medicine. And one plant probably contains hundreds and hundreds of different chemicals, which work together in an extraordinary synergy, meaning you don't get side effects. Now, modern medicine comes along and says, and that's interesting. Now, which <laughs> of those hundreds of chemicals is the active ingredient? Right, which, which is the one? one? Yeah. <laughs> right. It's the analytic divide and rule mentality. Cut it up. Right. It's very left brain, which is the active ingredient. And they find that and they give it. And lo and behold, it has the major intended effect powerfully, but it also has loads and loads of unintended event, it, it, you know, mm -hmm. um, effects, which would have been prevented by all the other chemicals with which it grows naturally. So true. You cannot beat nature. You can only learn from nature mm -hmm. and imitate nature. And yes, I agree. Even people who don't have a garden can grow herbs on their window ledge. So easy. And, yeah. And can sprout seeds on their window ledge. Yeah. Right? You know, I have people who can't digest pulses like beans mm -hmm. um, and, and lentils. But if you soak them for 12 hours, and then you sprout them, you put them in a little sprouter and you water them twice a day, you've got instant nutritious protein rich salad mm -hmm. on your window ledge. Right. And the plant has digested itself for you. Mm -hmm. And so it's much more digestible. And if you do this with broccoli seeds, so that broccoli, of course, contains sulforaphanes and diindolamiphane, these wonderful natural substances which help to prevent breast cancer, of mm -hmm. which we have an epidemic. But the little sprouted seedling of broccoli, 10 days old, has about 50 times more than the mature broccoli. It's amazing, and, isn't it? <laughs> this is extraordinary. And you can digest it better. And before you even start taking supplements, you sprout your own seedlings, grow your own salad on the window ledge. Mm -hmm. And that's the way to get through what farmers call the hungry gap you know, right. in temperate climates, certainly in, in Britain, from uh, kind of about now, early February, where all the autumn goodies have run out. <laughs> and certainly by March, they've run out and you haven't got the new salad coming through. You grow it on your window ledge. Yeah, we have a, a hydroponic tower in our house, but, and we use that. We use it. I don't usually do it much in the summer because I work at the farm. We have lots of vegetables right. and fruits, but in the winter, and it also has this, it's like green in the house. I have lots of plants, of course, but I love having that like garden in my house and having fresh herbs. And it's so different. Like you said, if, with the sprouts and the seeds and the aspect that you get from the live plant, it's contributing to your environment too, with the air that you breathe. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. You know, because we breathe out what the plants breathe in which is carbon right. dioxide, and they breathe out oxygen, which we breathe in. We need to live in green places. That symbiotic relationship is so key for us on the planet. <laughs> and there's a really good tip for people who are detoxing or very nutritionally deficient, which mm -hmm. is you can take supplements, but if you get the supplements in liquid form, and I'm thinking particularly of minerals like zinc, mm -hmm. selenium, and so on, you can add a couple of drops to the water in which you soak your seeds mm -hmm. and with which you then water your sproutlings and the plant will absorb that mineral and assimilate it into a natural form. And then when you eat the plant, your body's receiving that mineral in the way that nature intended it to. Mm -hmm. And this is another small way in which we can compensate for how depleted the soil is. Yeah. Oh, that's a great tip, Dr. Jenny, because it's so easy to do sprouts. I have a little sprouter and I think people are just like this. So they sometimes think, feel overwhelmed, right. About like how to start things, but start to start easy, make some seeds, make some sprouts, do some little seedlings. And if you mm -hmm. don't know, someone in your community knows or YouTube, or some, you can find the information. If you here's, need to know how to sprout. Mm -hmm. Here's another tip because we are talking about watering your seedlings. Let's so talk coming, about water. We all have chlorine coming out. We call it a tap. You call it a faucet. Don't we? Right. Yeah. Okay. So, well, we call it a tap too, but yes. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So chlorine is added to remove potentially dangerous microbes, fine, but they then don't remove the chlorine afterwards. I think in most of the states of North America, you have fluoride added as well. Yeah, almost. It's almost all, all chlorinated and almost every state is for fluor, yeah. has fluorine okay. added. Mm -hmm. So chlorine and fluoride are toxic halogens and halides, which push iodine out of the body. Yeah. And iodine is, of course, absolutely vital for the health of the breast tissue, the prostate, the thyroid gland, the yep. brain, the ovary, just about everything else. And until recently in the UK, only a few regions have had fluoride added to the water because mm. it's been a decision made by the local authority, the local council. 
And our dear Prime Minister has just decided that he's so concerned for children's dental health. Did you know Boris Johnson was deeply concerned about children's dental health? Mm -hmm. And therefore he wants to add fluoride. I'm sorry, I'm being sarcastic. Um, <laughs> he wants to add fluoride to oh, the water no. supply throughout the UK. So no. we will have no choice. <laughs> uh -huh. Now, in my practice, I see children from all over the UK and beyond. And mm -hmm. a disproportionate number of the children with neurodevelopmental disorders and very strange bone disorders are from the West Midlands and Birmingham, which is where they've had fluoride in their water for about 60 years. Mm, or interesting. Mm -hmm. that we are seeing the damage yeah. and what people also need to know because we're connecti connecting our health problems with the earth's health problems is that what fluoride is actually a toxic waste product a byproduct of the phosphate fertilizer industry mm -hmm. so here is another link with agriculture and they don't know what to do with their waste fluoride <laughs> right 40, <laughs> yeah, 40 years ago in the uk they were banned from putting it from expelling it um, from factory chimneys because it was mm -hmm. too toxic and now I think they've bought off the British Dental Association the American Dental Association and they want to put it in the water not only is it not good for children's teeth it's quite dangerous for bones and teeth and mm -hmm. brain and yeah. kidney and thyroid and so on right uh, and there's a wonderful book about this by Paul Connett mm -hmm. called Dr Paul Connett the case against fluoride so you, you know if it's in your water you need to invest in a water filter yeah hundred percent. Ideally, you know, plumbed in, not just sitting on the countertop, and right. ideally a, a whole house one, because yes, you don't want to be drinking it and cooking in it, but you also don't want to be bending and showering in the fluoride. And right. The chlorine. Yeah, so exactly. I, I think that's number one, actually. Mm -hmm. I think if you're going to start, get a plumbed in water filter. And I won't tell you it's not expensive. It is quite expensive. Yeah. Um, but it's not as expensive as buying bottled water, which is killing the planet too. <laughs> yeah. And if you do have to get bottled water occasionally, make sure it's bottled in glass, not plastic, because mm. plasticizer chemicals, plastics like BPA and phthalates, like some of the pesticides, they're estrogen mimics. Mm -hmm. So what they do is they look a bit like the female hormone estrogen. And so on all our cells, on the surface, we have receptors, proteins that are designed to be like the lock for the key of estrogen and other hormones. Yeah. So there's a lock and key thing going on here that these toxic pesticides and plasticizers occupy the receptors that nature intended for estrogen. So they have estrogenic effects, but worse. And they are right. certainly linked to our epidemics of breast cancer, prostate cancer, and other cancers of the female reproductive tract, like mm -hmm. the lining of the womb, the ovary, uh, and so on. So drinking your water, when you take it with you on a journey out of glass, not plastic, is a simple thing to do. Getting your water filtered. If you're a student and you're in rental accommodation and you can't plumb in a water filter, then at least get a countertop one. Right. But make sure the jug into which the water is filtering is ideally glass but if not then rock hard plastic and in the refrigerator yeah because we don't want the sun shining on plastic that releases the estrogen mimic mm -hmm. plasticizer chemicals into your water there are loads and loads of tips like that in the book for simple things you can do to not be poisoned um, and there's a wonderful book actually published over here by pat thomas called cleaning yourself to death um, <laughs> and she gives alternatives to all the nasty chemicals we have you know, under our kitchen sinks and in our bathroom cabinets as well. All the stuff we put on ourselves, the perfume, the deodorant, the air freshener we spray around, the stuff we use to clean our kitchens, all of that can be replaced in most cases just by warm water and a damp cloth. Right. Um, the basics or, yeah, of soap and water can yeah. really just Or you can clean your windows with vinegar. Right. That's what know. I use, vinegar and essential oil. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So you know, obviously there are alternatives to all these things because long before the industrial revolution, people were still cleaning their homes. Cleaning is not a new thing. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But the toxic chemicals are. Mm -hmm. And I test, I see what's there. I tell people where it's come from, how to avoid it forever after. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, how to detox it, how to get it out of the system. And it starts with good nutrition because yeah. if you've got tip top levels of vitamins, minerals, essential fatty acids, and enough protein, which for some people does mean animal protein, um, 
then you can cope with almost any toxin the world throws at you. <laughs> exactly. Dr. Jenny, you talked about a lot of uh, amazing things in that little past piece there. And I want to highlight a couple things that you said. One, can, let's go back and talk about the cells because you mentioned some of the aspects of the reproductive system that were affected in the thyroid. So how mm. are toxins particularly affecting the cells of the mitochondria of the cells, the energy powerhouse of the cells, the DNA of the cells, how are toxins affecting, affecting that cellular vitality, which is, you know, shifting so many mm. aspects of our body and our future generations? Yeah, absolutely. The answer to that is partly we don't know much because there hasn't been any research on it because research <laughs> has to be funded and no drug company has an interest in funding that kind of what's really making us sick research. But what we do know is that way back in our evolution, the mitochondria, which are the energy manufacturers within the cell, were bacteria, they have many features in common, and they became so symbiotic with us, mm -hmm. so essential, them for us and us for them, that they're now really an organ of our body in the same way that the couple of kilograms of bacteria and other creatures living in our colon, mm -hmm. um, the microbiome is an organ of the body. Right. So within each cell, you've got many mitochondria whose job is to make energy, particularly high numbers of them in muscle cells and brain cells, mm -hmm. right? And if you're tired, that's what goes first, your muscles and your brain. <laughs> right, you're like ready for a nap. <laughs> um, because they were once in their ancient history, actually free living bacteria, antibiotics really messed them up. Mm, yeah, that totally and makes sense. Antibiotics are designed to damage bacteria, and it right. seems that they cause extreme fatigue in some people by messing with the mitochondria. Something else that will mess with the mitochondrial production of energy is statin drugs. Mm, mm -hmm. Statins are given to lower cholesterol levels, and we can come back to that later with right. the thing why and, and how to do it naturally and safely. But cholesterol is actually essential for life. It's part of the bile, which you can't digest without. It's needed for the sunshine to turn into vitamin D just under your skin. So mm -hmm. the best way to lower your cholesterol is to sunbathe. Depending where you live, that may or may not be practical. Right. Um, <laughs> but in the synthesis of cholesterol, the biochemical pathway that the body has, where A turns to B, turns to C, turns to D, and there's an enzyme organizing each step of that pathway, in the pathway to make cholesterol, there is something called CoQ10, mm -hmm. and it's essential for the process, and the statin drugs knock it out. That's right. They That's knock right. out CoQ10 quite intentionally, so you won't be able to make cholesterol. So you'll have low cholesterol, which, by the way, makes your brain function very poorly. And your hormones. <laughs> yeah, and you can't make hormones. because Right. <laughs> no wonder you're it messed up. All our essential hormones. Um but if you've locked out the CoQ10, mm -hmm. that is one of the crucial factors needed for your mitochondria to make energy within the cell. It's what my colleague, Dr. Sarah Myhill, calls the mitochondrial medicines. You need coenzyme Q10, you need vitamin B3, that's mm -hmm. B33, and all the other B vitamins to help it along. You need carnitine, which you can only get from meat. Yep. And you need magnesium, but you need a lot of magnesium. You might have just about enough magnesium to relax your muscles, but you need loads of magnesium for proper energy production. Mm -hmm. It's a huge one. Any of those, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. and so if any of those four are knocked out, then you can't make energy properly. And the other thing that can happen to your mitochondria rather than lack of the right nutrients is toxicity and any toxin it seems can damage the mitochondria they are among the most vulnerable mm -hmm. uh, and, and i see this again and again and it does it does depend on your genetic tendencies as well right so a toxin that will make one person completely knocked out will have no effect on the other because of genetic differences but these genetic differences would have made no difference to those people's health before the Industrial Revolution. <laughs> yes. Right. Prior to that, they didn't make people ill. So um, with the mitochondria, there uh, is an enzyme called superoxide dismutase. Mm -hmm. whose job is to clean up the waste products that the mitochondria naturally produce, because in right. the energy production process, there are toxic substances produced as waste products but in the natural way of things, they would be vacuumed up immediately <laughs> yeah. by this enzyme. And like it's a Hoover. Like your, okay, we call them the dustmen or the bin men. You call them the trash collectors. Right, okay? yeah. The, guys, yeah uh -huh. guys who come around in the truck, 
if they stopped collecting your garbage oh my gosh <laughs> within a few months everybody would be really sick so if the superoxide dismutase enzyme isn't working so great and it's not hoovering up the garbage that the mitochondria make as waste products those waste products will build up and stop the mitochondria functioning now there are genetic differences in how well we make that enzyme mm -hmm. but if you are deficient in zinc or copper or manganese then that enzyme won't work properly yeah exactly and if you've been exposed to particular environmental toxins it will knock that enzyme out as well so there are numerous mechanisms and i do um go into them in the middle of chapter seven in my book there are mm -hmm. about 10 specific different mechanisms by which toxins can damage the mitochondria toxic lipids petrochemicals can damage the cell membranes right which are absolutely crucial pesticides and plasticizers are fat soluble so they'll dissolve in the cell membranes and they'll get through into every system of the body mm -hmm. which is why we're now seeing so much multi-system illness and certainly over here if you go to your family doctor with symptoms in 10 different parts of your body they'll just put their head in their hands and say oh my goodness <laughs> but it's all in your head right the oh. irony of it is when they say it's all in your head yes they're trying to dismiss the patient as psychosomatic but actually right. they may be literally correct because these petrochemical toxins being fat soluble they aggregate where there is the highest ratio of fatty tissue and that's the brain mm -hmm. and the exactly yeah which is why fatigue and headaches are among the first symptoms that we see mm -hmm. um, but yeah there's so much we can do to avoid all this and part of what we need to do because the soil is so depleted is to take supplements mm -hmm. but this is a minefield and actually the main area that shocked me when I was researching my book, I was researching for the shortest chapter in the book, it's chapter six called Nourish and Flourish. Mm -hmm. And it's about why you might sometimes, some of the time, need some supplements, right? Particularly in the winter, probably not at all in the summer. But in looking into this, I started going around the chemist shops, you call it a drugstore. Right, the pharmacy or drugstore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> pharmacy or drugstore so I'm taking my magnifying glass and I'm looking at these pots of pills which are marketed mm -hmm. as nutritional right healthy with children <laughs> right yeah even though it's, and you look at what's it sometimes you can't see the label and there's a tiny little tag you have to peel back <laughs> because on the front it just says vitamin c vitamin b blah blah but actually when you look there are only tiny amounts of those and they're right at the end of the list. And the list has things like sucrose, which is sugar, and right. dextrose, which is sugar, and maltose, which is sugar, and maltodextrin, which is sugar, and <laughs> calcium <the> carbonate, <laughs> yeah. which is chalk, and a load of additives and fillers and glues and colorings. And that's not food. So that's bad. Food. No, that's not food. Not good for your cells at all. <laughs> yeah, oh. I was I had a I was interviewing a guest for my podcast last week, and she's a specialist in neurodegenerative disorders in children and tick disorders. And we talked all about like, you know, how important it is to have those crucial supplements that are actually supplements. And now yeah. people are like, oh, I'm just gonna give my kids these gummies because they're they're they'll take them. I'm like, that's gotta not be good for your children. <laughs> they claim the manufacturers claim that these are vitamins disguised as sweeties they are candy dis, um, disguised as vitamins mm -hmm. and, and obviously you know it starts with diet it starts with eating you know good food that's in season ideally locally grown certainly organic a wide range of vegetables a wide range of fruit but not too much ideally for most people some organic meat some wild caught fish mm -hmm. dairy depending not if right. you get a bunged up nose or you have asthma or eczema but otherwise organic raw unpasteurized dairy can be good for some of the people some of the time mm -hmm. to find out whether it's right for you i describe a very sophisticated method i call suck it and see <laughs> right there's a way you can do a, a home-based elimination diet to see whether a particular food is right for you or not i yeah. explain that in chapter four yeah and and so there's all sorts you can do basically eggs again have been demonized and i think organic free-range eggs laid by happy hens happy chickens are a really important food 
Egg yolk is full of phosphated alcoholine. We need those proteins. We also need the vegetable proteins, but you know, yeah. the beans, the peas, the pulses. We need loads and loads of fresh herbs. If you have enough of them in a culinary sense, you may not even need them in a medicinal sense, which just yeah. means in a more concentrated form. And then there's this whole debate about carbohydrate. And I come down on the side of moderation. Some whole grains are fine for some people some of the time. The macrobiotic people in back in the 70s had been right. <laughs> living on nothing but brown rice. And, <laughs> yeah. did, and you've got the paleo keto people at the other extremes. They never touch grains, just eat meat. Yeah, maybe somewhere I in the middle. <laughs> I, I'm in the middle. Yeah. And I also think there is no one size fits all diet. You know? Yeah, it depends on the cells and the what's going yeah. on in the body and how toxic you are, how much you need to clean up the system. <laughs> and it depends whether you live in a hot climate or a cold climate. Right. Whether you're young or old, male or female, you know, pregnant, menopausal, postmenopausal are all those things, your metabolism and your hormones. Mm -hmm. And that's why I give a very few basic rules that apply to everyone. Mm -hmm. They're in the introduction. So basically, eat Oh yeah, greens. the four golden rules, yeah. right? I, yeah. <laughs> eat your greens, cut out sugar, cut out artificial additives and eat organic. Once you've been doing that for a few weeks, your diet is pure, but hopefully still varied. Mm -hmm. Then you can do the socket and seed technique <laughs> to find out what particular food might be disagreeing with you. Because nobody can tell you that. And honestly, I think a lot of the blood tests and the skin prick tests for allergy are a waste of time. Yeah. I think it's more accurate and more scientific to try it out yourself, how to do that. And yeah, the first four chapters are winter, spring, summer, and autumn. Mm -hmm. um, eating for the seasons. Can you talk a little bit about that? The importance sure. of that based on why it's important to eat for the seasons, nutritionally, for the earth, for our environment, for us. <laughs> Okay, so firstly, if you're eating food that's local and in season, mm -hmm. it's not being shipped from the other side of the planet. Right, so from not, Costa Rica or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> so you're not, or, or much further away. Here we are New in Zealand. the Northern Hemisphere, <laughs> in Britain, mm -hmm. and we've, we've got peas coming from Kenya, and we've got apples right. coming from New Zealand. And it isn't necessary, because there's almost always something in season. Okay, mm -hmm. so right now... We've got oranges coming from just across the water in Europe and we shouldn't be eating apples and pears anymore. We need to wait till the autumn. Mm -hmm. But in the summer, we've got berries mm -hmm. and berries summer are great. berries. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's common sense, really, to eat what grows when it grows, because then it's fresh. Mm -hmm. So, you know, with no variety and having the same thing month in, month out the food becomes a lot less special. When I was a kid, it was really exciting to get the first strawberries in mm. June. That's right. Oh. If you eat them all the year round, then when it they're out, they gross season, anyway. They taste, <laughs> they taste horrible anyway. They just taste of water and sugar. Right, cardboard um, berries. <laughs> yeah. So it's common sense. Other common mm. sense things are eat much more salad in the summer and much right. more cooked food, soups and stews and casseroles in the winter. Um, in a British winter, certainly you need vitamin C, vitamin D and zinc throughout the winter, mm -hmm. October mm -hmm. to April. And you shouldn't really need any of them in the summer. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, a, a lot of it is common sense. So before the Industrial Revolution, we had no choice. We just ate what grew right. when it grew. <laughs> what I think is also interesting about this is to take the evolutionary perspective. So in terms of the speed of biological evol evolution, 10,000 years is nothing. So we still have the bodies of hunter-gatherers. If we think how the hunter-gatherers ate, it was definitely seasonal unless they were at the end. <laughs> and most of the time they were actually vegan, but about once every couple of weeks or once a month, they would catch a big wild animal mm -hmm. and share it out. And that's very interesting to me because firstly, they ate all of it as hunter-gatherer tribes still do today, not just the muscle meat, which- Right, really every part of the animal was used. <laughs> The fat, the brain, all the glands, the testes, the ovaries. My theory is that the postmenopausal women would have gone straight for the ovaries. Right, exactly. <laughs> the glands, so the gland ate, nutrients. You know, <laughs> the glands, the bone marrow, all those things. And guess what you get from doing that? You get vitamins A, D, E, and K. Mm -hmm. The fat the soluble. Fat soluble <laughs> vitamins, which last. You don't need them every day, only need them every few weeks. And that's what our hunter-gatherer ancestors got. What you do need every single day is the water-soluble vitamins B and C. Mm -hmm. And of course, they would have got the vitamin C from the fruits and the berries and the little seedlings. And they would have got all the B vitamins, again, from the seeds that they picked, which were probably already sprouting and so digestible. So that's, I think, a very useful model. 
Mm -hmm. to think how did our ancestors eat not that long ago in biological time right no not that far away (laughs) we've been homo sapiens or femo sapienta as i like to call (laughs) us um, on this planet for Oh, a couple of million years. We've been recognizable as the species that we are for about 200,000 years. And we've only been farming for 10,000 years. Wow, it's amazing that difference in timing. Yeah. It's vastly increased the amount of grains and dairy that we've eaten. <laughs> right. And it's vastly narrowed the range of plants and animals that we eat. It used to be a thousand different plants and animals in a year. And it's got narrower and narrower. Most people eat you know, three or four types of meat, maybe 10 types of vegetables. I say to people, go to the shop at the store and buy a vegetable you've never eaten before. Exactly. I tell that all the time to my patients too. Try something new for your diet this week. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the more we increase the variety of vegetables we're eating, the more we increase the diversity of our microbiome. I call them our trillions of tiny companions that live in the gut and they make all the B vitamins for us, but we rely, they rely on us for vitamin D. So we have to get enough sunshine and vitamin D, you know, oily fish or sunshine to feed them because they can't make vitamin D. They live where the sun don't shine. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. You have a great chapter in your book. We won't have time to talk about today, but listeners, uh, it's all about sunscreen and, or a section in a chapter, I should say. And I know myself being a very fair skin and I've had so many sunburns in my lifetime, but I actually try to use sunscreen as little as possible and just try to cover up myself because I just, because I know I'm going to burn, but I don't want the toxins. I use a non-toxic sunscreen, but I want the vitamin D and I want to, so I always like, I'm going to go outside and when it's warm out and sit in the sun for at least 20 minutes, I try to do that every day to soak it in. And then I'll cover up and allow me like a big hat, (laughs) full on outfit. You know, you can, you can cover up with clothing rather than chemicals. Exactly. The section you describe is in uh, chapter three, which is about summer. Mm -hmm. And one of the things about seasonality, it's not just about eating differently. It's about the hazards of the different seasons. Autumn, I don't know which part of the States you're in, but certainly in in the UK, a major hazard of autumn is molds. Mm, Yeah. We haven't talked about molds because they're natural, right? They produce toxins, which are not synthetic toxins. They're natural in the sense that a mold is a single celled fungal organism. What is unnatural, I think, is the way we've constructed houses that are so well insulated that there aren't any drafts anymore. People don't open their windows. And so what we do is we have this insulated box we live in and then we cook and we breathe and we bathe. So we produce loads of steam. So Mm -hmm. we get condensation on the walls. And so mold grows. Right. And again, in the autumn chapter, I've got really simple tips to avoid that. And they're not ecologically great because you have to have the heating on, but the windows open. Yeah. The only single example of where what's good for the planet, what's good for the person are not identical But you have to mimic the Mediterranean climate, which is hot and dry. So you have some heat if it's winter, but you have windows open. So you get warm air circulating and then the molds don't build up because Mm -hmm. I've certainly seen arthritis and asthma and eczema and even cancer resulting from accumulation of mycotoxins. That's M-Y-C-O, mycotoxins, Mm. which are what molds produce. Yeah, it's very toxic for the system and especially for the energy of the system, like the mitochondria, like you were mentioning earlier. And uh, yeah, we live in the uh, Southeast in the mountains. So we do a rainforest in the summer and then we have cold winters, some snow, but yeah, we do have a lot of uh, mold because of that humid environment and we're inside and, but I use all kinds of techniques and I love the ones you talk about in your book to reduce that mold in our environment and like squeegee, Mm -hmm. I do that in my showers too, to make sure and leave the fan on. To dry yeah. things out and That's yeah true. and i lived in seattle and it was really bad mold there black okay. mold would just be like on the walls you're like oh, this is not good for my system in Asheville, north carolina in the blue ridge mountains oh right mm-hmm. okay. yeah yes. John denver sings about them doesn't he? that's right that's right yeah <laughs> he, it's beautiful beautiful here i love it so much one thing i wanted to talk about i know we have so many things we could talk about in your book but you mentioned magnesium earlier, but there in your book, you talk about why it's so important to take magnesium in the winter. And since we're in winter, I wanted you to touch base on that because I want people to understand the importance of that seasonality of of nutrients. Yeah. Magnesium is is the most amazing mineral. It has at least a hundred functions, individual biochemical functions in the body. It's required for so many enzymes to do their job. But in particular, 
the brain needs it to think clearly. We need it to make energy in the mitochondria for our muscles. We also need it for our muscles to relax, right? So right at the beginning of medical school, they taught us the microanatomy of muscles. Mm -hmm. And you have these two types of fibrils, they call them, mm -hmm. that move in and out of each other, actin and myosin. Yeah. And when a muscle contracts, you know, when you do that, then the fibers go together. That requires calcium. In order for them to move apart again, for you to relax or stretch that muscle, that calcium has to be pushed out by an atom of magnesium. Mm -hmm. So without magnesium, you literally cannot relax your muscles and you cannot stretch your muscles without pulling them and doing damage. Right. So every athlete and everybody who moves their body and everyone who exercises, which, which should, should be everybody, every, out everybody there. under 90, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of people are over 90, needs magnesium. Mm -hmm. Now, why might we be low in magnesium? Partly because when we're under stress, we use it up. Mm -hmm. We pee it out. Right. And it's an evolutionary glitch, which I don't fully understand. I mean, I have got a theory <laughs> about it. But we lose magnesium when we're under stress. Then our muscles get tight, which had some evolutionary, if you were running away from a lion or whatever. Right. Um, but then we get more stress. So there's this negative feedback loop between the brain and the muscles, which can yeah. only be broken by taking magnesium as a supplement, eating the foods that are rich in magnesium, mm -hmm. which is leafy green vegetables. Actually, the magnesium is better absorbed if they're cooked rather than raw. Right, like a little steam or, kale or something like yes. that. Mm -hmm. or, or made into soup, although the antioxidants are absorbed better when it's raw. So we mm -hmm. need some raw and some. Oh, yeah, a little imbalance of both. <laughs> raw at lunchtime and cooked in the evening yeah. is actually the best balance, mm -hmm. according to the seasons as well. Mm -hmm. um, but the other way to get magnesium in is to have a bath in Epsom salts. Oh, I love that. <laughs> Epsom salts is magnesium sulfate. And the magnesium goes in through the skin and relaxes the muscles. Mm -hmm. The sulfate goes in and helps your detox pathways in your all your biochemistry, particularly to detox the estrogen pathways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the um, liver. Mm -hmm. And it is just an amazing thing to do. The autistic kids that do this, they relax and it helps them go to sleep. And kids mm -hmm. with ADHD as well. Epsom salts bath last thing at night without a bright bathroom light on. Right. Candlelight, mm -hmm. lavender in the water, soft music playing. 20 minutes in that Epsom salts bath. It will be an easier night for mom and dad. Oh, I love that. And, and that's yeah. I, the bathing, all that you said, talking about the magnesium and then having the uh, Epsom salt baths. I just did one over the weekend. I was in a really large workout and I was so sore. I was like, okay, I got to get into the Epsom salt bath. And there's also that ratio. You want to make sure you're like, sometimes patients will ask me like, well, how much should I put in? I'm like, you don't want to be, you want to be liberal with the Epsom salts because you actually need a lot of that Epsom yeah. salt with the magnesium. So you need, I, I usually tell them only like two to four cups. What do you recommend? Men for that mag magnesium ratio yeah. it's in there in chapter six now cups is an american measure which we don't oh, use. right you guys cups use can be grams. any size you right. cups, small cups. so what i say is about a pound of epsom salts which is about 400 grams mm -hmm. in a bath mm -hmm. right. that's quite a lot when you've done that let's say every other night for three months then you can halve the amount right but there was actually a study done on it by professor rosemary waring if you want to look it up w-a-r-i-n-g mm -hmm. at the university of birmingham interestingly in the uk and she was working with the autistic kids and she measured the magnesium in the red blood cells which of course is the most accurate way to measure it because mm -hmm. it's a brass cellular mineral lives inside the cells um, and it really went up after three months of having epsom salts bath every night the kids calmed down mm -hmm. magnesium levels went up and the mums got in with them and their aches and pains went away. <laughs> oh, look it, at that. It's a, <laughs> sure, it's a very Brilliant. traditional treatment mm -hmm. uh, for arthritis. Right. In the 19th century, people used to go and take the waters, which takes us back to what's in the water. I forgot to say earlier, no European country has put fluoride in their water. We have almost all of it is now. It's about by the state control, you know, each state controls their own uh, water system. So then it, it has the differences depending on what they put in it. And you don't know what's going in it. Filtered water. I, yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Make sure. Yeah. I think that's number one. And yeah. then the quality of the air inside your house, getting rid of those chemicals, making sure you're eating really well. And if you are going to take supplements, get your magnifying glass out. 
and exactly. read the ingredients list. Yeah, it's so important to know what it is. And if you don't know the ingredient, don't buy it. Look it up. If it's a long Latin sounding name, it may be the name of a nasty chemical, but it may also be the name of a flower in Latin. You know, right. Maybe yeah, like an herbal like plant. <laughs> Lavendula augusti flora just right. means lavender. Right. You know. Just fancy so, Latin words. <laughs> so you just need to take your time, really, because mm -hmm. and, and it's not just about food, actually. It's about cosmetics as well. Right. Anything you put on your skin, you really shouldn't put anything on your skin that you wouldn't be happy to put in your mouth. So mm -hmm. read the ingredients list when you go and buy moisturizer and that sort of thing as well. Yeah, um, that's you can get beautiful natural things based on co coconut oil and shea butter and so on with lovely natural scents. Or you can get toxic petrochemicals, which you don't want to put on your skin because they're going to go straight in and they are carcinogenic. So, you know, we can avoid these things. Just yeah. a little knowledge, which is why I've Yay, why you wrote your book. And let's yeah. talk about, so one last question as we're wrapping up, I, I know we could probably talk forever, Dr. Jenny, but we're gonna, one last question, and then uh, we'll talk about where people can find your book and all of your good uh, social media. So if you had an unlimited budget right now, what would you do to make the biggest impact on the health and welfare of the planet? Okay. <laughs> like, Actually, <laughs> I, no, I would begin with agriculture. Mm -hmm. There is a huge move towards regenerative agriculture and governments have the power to make that feasible. Right? There is enough to feed everybody on this planet without genetically modifying the crops and without drenching them in pesticides and you know, insecticides and artificial fertilizers. So I would convert everybody to organic gardening, and the other thing would be public transportation systems everywhere that are clean and efficient and affordable and pleasant and reliable and fast so that hardly anybody needed to use their cars mm -hmm. because exhaust fumes are a huge problem. And changing to electric cars is not totally going to solve that because mm -hmm. you still need to create that electricity somehow. Right. And if, if far more people use public transportation, we call it public transport here. And then they wouldn't need their cars and the roads would not be choked with fumes. So there we are. You, you asked me one thing and I gave you two. No, that's great. Those are both wonderful. I love both of them. And uh, we'll make those happen. Ding. I think that's <laughs> super important. And it's so interesting. I think about transportation all the time where we live. The United States is so huge. It's and we had this way to get across and back and forth with trains. And then we like eliminated, we still have a train system, but it's so poor compared mm. to the to Europe and I think we we are just behind on all public transportation and I we have one car in our family we just I walk and ride my bike and try as much as I can to not use my car but electric cars are not the solution one also they're so expensive like who can afford one they have to make so we have to make it so that that's a whole nother thing it has to be a, something of course like you said it's more in where people don't need to have that car or the different aspects of it electric cars are not the solution yeah, if you make public transportation affordable and attractive, and fun. then however <laughs> high the cost of petrol, gasoline, gas goes, mm -hmm. um, it doesn't matter. Because you, if you yeah. could get anywhere you wanted by getting on a train, and you knew that if you missed that train, there'd be another one along in 10 minutes, mm -hmm. and it would be a smooth, fast ride, right. then we wouldn't need to be choking up our roads. But I think there's a culture of individualism, and like, I want to be in my little metal box. Exactly. Going where I'm going. Control. I'm going. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's a control huge aspect easy. of it. Yeah. It's like the dollar sign, the control dollar sign. Yeah. I think that's a big part of it for sure. So hopefully that will continue to shift and evolve. Okay. Dr. Jenny, how can people find you? Your website is drjennygoodman.com. We'll put that on there. And that's where you can find everything about your book. You have the paper copy, the audio, the audible version and the digital version, right? Both of those three versions. Yes. Yes. It, mm -hmm. It's a paperback and audio book and an ebook. The only thing is when people have got the audio book and the ebook, they say to me, how do I find out about how to use vitamin C to detoxify metals? And I say, oh, it's on page 305. I think you don't get page numbers with Audible or eBook. So, oh, you know. yeah, anyway. the Audible, you don't. You're right. But eBook, yeah. it does have pages on the eBook oh, or numbers. It? Okay. it should. And mine does. And the one you sent me did, yours. Right. And okay. maybe they just the Audible, though, that doesn't. I think it would be too much verbiage. Yeah. So the website, drjennygoodman.com, has got 
all four social media channels, you know, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. It's got the links to those. It's got a direct link to being able to purchase the book, which is called Staying Alive in Toxic Times, subtitle, A Seasonal Guide to Lifelong Health. By the way, the nature of the design was my idea, but the actual designer is from LA. Oh, nice. That's yeah. great. Yeah, so it's a, a beautiful nice, cover. I love it when I saw it. Nice I was like, oh, it's perfect. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it's coming out in Poland in translation in a couple of weeks. Oh, that's fun. Congrats Already on that. It's out in Slovenian. So. I'll be in Slovenia in, in April. So I'll look for it. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Ginny. It's been such a joy to have you on this show today. We'll put all of that great stuff in the show notes so the listeners can get a copy of your book and learn how to live their best life possible. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed talking with you as well. Thank you. All right.